In the dawning hours of the 21st of March 1960, Robert Mangalisa Sabukwe left his home in Mafola Soweto and began the five kilometer walk to the Orlando police station. In so doing, he was personally putting into action his nationwide call for a decisive non-violent campaign against the pass laws. As president of the Pan-Africanist Congress, Subukwe had called on all black South Africans on this day to leave their passbooks at home, walk to the nearest police station and demand arrest. I remember it very well. I took him as far as Chabalala supermarket store and continued to my clinic. It was not far from Mfulu. I went there on foot and they left for Orlando police station. When we came to Orlando police station, so we said, this is the core of my men. That's why evening when we come to them, we told them that we surrender for arrest too, because we can no longer carry the bus. We have had it enough, enough is enough. I was there at Orlando police station, and Sabukwe went inside and knocked on the door of the officer commanding. I heard at a place called Bofalong, the police had opened fire, and it was thought that at least two people had been killed. And I went across and told Sabukwe, and he was profoundly disturbed by this. He had, remember, sent a letter on the Friday to the commissioner of police to tell him about the coming campaign and to ask him to ensure that the police remained non-violent. Heeding Sabukwe's call, black South Africans presented themselves for arrest at police stations countrywide in their thousands. I got to the shop hall and we got into this crowd. The police evidence afterwards of this threatening crowd, uh, it just wasn't true, because I was in the thick of that crowd. And once I knew us from the Randani Mail, all that people wanted to do was to tell me their grievances, and suddenly the shots began. And in the evening, we read in the papers about Sharpville massacre. They were really sad. It really broke their hearts. For Robert Sabukwe, the 21st of March 1960 began as any other day. By nightfall, his actions had determined the course of history in South Africa. 69 people died in the hail of police gunfire at Sharpville that day. The shooting reverberated around the world and emblazoned indelibly the profile of apartheid oppression on the consciousness of the international community. Caught off guard, the regime was now fully aware of Sabukwe's enormous influence and power. He was imprisoned for three years. Determined to neutralize his influence on the eve of his release three years later, the regime passed a bill through Parliament, the so-called Sabukwe Clause, which would enable his indefinite incarceration, as they put it, this side of eternity. Robert Mangalisa Sabukwe, the youngest of four surviving children, was born in the township of Umasizake, outside Hrafrenet on the 5th of December 1924. It was a hard and simple life. There was no electricity or running water, and the children slept on the floor. Sabukwe's mother, Angelina, had never been to school. His father, Hubert, forced by family circumstances to leave school after Standard 5, was passionately driven to ensure the education of his children. With his meager income, Sabukwe's father made sure that he brought books into the home and encouraged his children to read. Sabukwe attended primary school at the Umasezake Township Methodist Church Mission. With no secondary schooling available to blacks in Hrafrenet, Robert Sabukwe waited for two years before obtaining financial assistance to go to Heald Town, a Methodist educational institution near Fort Beaufort. He was the closest friend I had at school. Robert was a, a voracious reader. He was very keen on English literature, particularly poetry. I remember one that he really loved was uh, Gray's Elegy, Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air. Now, he loved those two lines. And in the classics, he loved Charles Dickens, 
particularly a tale of two cities. And uh, also he loved Baroness Oxy's uh, Scarlet Pimpernel. In biography, he preferred to read the biographies of the chaps in America because he felt that uh, this is where these people started fighting slavery, you know. He was that sort of man. He had a lot of empathy with other people. Very sensitive and uh, the sort of chap who would not tolerate injustice. He liked music and uh, he was also, curious enough, a Christian. He loved church music particularly. And of course, he and I loved the classics like Mozart, Brahms, that sort of thing. Robert was very articulate. His language was meticulous. He was really very well respected because the man was, even in those days, you know, you could see the potential of a leader in him. Near death with tuberculosis, in his final year at Healdtown, Robert Sabukwe rallied to earn a first-class matric pass, which took him to the University of Fort Hare in 1947. Fort Hare was a crucible of intellectual engagement. The roots of Sabukwe's political philosophy are found in the issues of non-collaboration, pan-Africanism and African nationalism under heated debate at the time. He was a founding member of the ANC Youth League at Fort Hare, and in his final year he was unanimously elected as president of the SRC. On his graduation in 1949, Sabukwe had made his mark as orator and student leader. When I met him, he was already in politics. We met at the Victoria Hospital, I was trained there as a nurse. When I first saw him, I think my heart skipped a beat. It was love at first sight. After completing midwifery, I went to Fryhead, where I was working as a trained nurse. He was teaching in Standerton General High School. I used to write to him and tell him that I'm passing Standerton to Devon or Fryhead or Ladysmith. And he used to come there and meet me. At the Standerton station, on my way to work, we got married in 1954 in Johannesburg. He was teaching at Witz University as a lecturer in, in Bantu languages. And I was enormously impressed when I heard him speak in meetings, because there was a strength about him. The Africanists were developing as a separate force, and he was clearly emerging as the leader of the Africanists. The communal hall in Orlando was the setting for the Watershed ANC conference in November 1958, which saw the Africanists part ways with the mother body. With the adoption of the Cliptown Charter in 1955, the Africanists were concerned that the ANC had discarded the 1949 Program of Action. They were also concerned that the direction and control of the movement was being manipulated by the Communist Party. The PAC was launched at the same venue the following year in April 1959. And by the end of the year, we were heading for the first national conference of the PAC in Orlando. It was at that conference that one of the most important decisions was taken to challenge the past laws. I remember one single year, 1957, when as much as 368,000 Africans were arrested and charged under one aspect of the past laws. A thousand people and more per day, every day, on the average. That is what it meant. And Sobukwe saw all this. He understood it. It was his people who were suffering. And the PAC took a decision at that Congress, under Sobukwe's leadership, that we were going to take final decisive action against the past laws. And powers were given to Sobukwe to call the nation as soon as possible. And we were amazed at the simplicity of the plan. Sobukwe decided that on a given day, a local branch of the PAC, under the local leadership, would move to the nearest police station and get to the police station and say to those in charge of the police station, look, here we are. <laughs> we don't have our first. The whole idea was that uh, you had to give non-violence a chance. That was Sobukwe's mission. 
On Friday the 18th of March, Sabukwe announced that the moment had come. The decisive non-violent campaign demanding the abolition of the pass laws and a minimum wage for Africans would be launched in 72 hours. On the eve of March the 21st, Sabukwe attended his resignation to the University of the Witwatersrand. The following morning, Sabukwe put into practice his call to the nation and history took its course. Under the PAC banner of service, sacrifice and suffering and the strategy of no bail, no defense, no fine, the PAC leadership had placed themselves at the forefront of the campaign. Sabukwe, initiator of the campaign, was arrested with 23 of the executive committee and held at the Johannesburg fort pending trial. Meanwhile, in the Western Cape, a week-long stay-away intensified the campaign. At Langa, police responded brutally and history once more took its course. They moved into Langa. I think it was around 2 o'clock at night and it was house to house beating up people. Now on that morning of the 30th of March, here was a situation which was presenting itself and the PAC, which was the initiator of the whole thing, decided that we are now not marching to any police station, but marching straight to parliament. And we led this column past Mowbray Station, up Dival Drive, past Hrodeskir, skirting Table Mountains, down into the street that goes straight into Parliament. By the time we reached town, the town was already filled with curious, interested people who just wanted to see what's going on. Unaware that the Minister F.C. Irasma had given the Commissioner of the Police for the Western Cape orders that we have to be shot that morning. And Parliament was sitting. And if Hosanna had lifted his little finger, that city could have been sacked that day. And they knew it. The government was in a state of absolute fear that day. And I'm telling you, we were damn determined. <laughs> and all that we wanted to talk to the commissioner of the police was that he should set up an appointment with Mr. F.C. Erasmus, the Minister of Justice. Well, they realized they can't move this crowd of 60,000 cramped into the city of Cape Town. After 30 minutes, they came back to say, Mr. Kosana, the minister has agreed to meet you this afternoon. Could you please remove this crowd from the city? And I want to believe that uh, sometimes little miracles do happen and that our people could stand inside the city of Cape Town for at least something like two hours without touching a glass or breaking anything. I asked for the police loudspeaker and just to tell the people that we have secured an appointment with the minister. And I reminded them what Sobukwe had said. When you have reached an agreement with the police, just obey what the police say. And that whole crowd moved back. And I knew that that appointment really meant nothing except now that I was going to go with a small group of people who just belonged. Philip Kosana was detained on that historic afternoon of the 30th of March 1960 and whilst on bail, left South Africa for 36 years in exile. In the wake of March 1960, the PAC and ANC were banned, and thousands of South Africans were arrested and jailed. Robert Sabukwe was sentenced on the 4th of May 1960 to three years hard labor. Your worship, he said from the dock, we believe in one race only, the human race to which we all belong. The history of that race is a long struggle, and we would have betrayed the human race if we had not done our share. We stand for equal rights for all individuals and are not afraid of the consequences. Sabukwe, having served his three-year sentence now due for release, the apartheid government so feared his influence they implemented their Sabukwe clause. This clause enabled them to detain Sabukwe indefinitely. On the 23rd of April 1963, Sabukwe was secretly flown to Robben Island, where he was incarcerated in isolation. The state then extended this incarceration a year at a time up until 1969. I only knew him starting when we went to visit him at uh, Robben Island. At the time, I didn't know whom we were going to visit. I didn't know that I had a father for that matter. I think I was around six. We stayed together with him for the entire two weeks, spending 
mornings, afternoons and evenings confined inside that, uh, that place of his. There was no living soul never around him. He was kept under solitary confinement for the duration of his stay there. If that's not suffering, I don't know how would you term that. I was just happy when I was around him, even though we didn't talk much. We didn't talk much. He was a person who never complained. He just accepted everything. We were just proud of him. Benji was a great friend of my husband. In fact, he was just like a brother to him. He supported him spiritually. And as he came to see us almost every month, he was very supportive. Once he was on the island, I applied for permission to go and see him. And we had six days together. We'd go to an interview room and we'd sit at a table all day long talking. It was clear he hadn't changed. He was as determined, as certain as ever about where he'd been and where he wanted to go. We had what was told us, the old leader is here. And then we were very anxious to see him. Following day when we were taken to work, we were pulling bamboo out of the sea. We passed that house and we saw him, we knew him. It was, he took up the ground and, uh, and, and, and spread it for us. And then we saluted him, our salute. And then we were sure that it was him. The routine was a bit difficult because he never knew when breakfast was being brought to him. So it might be at six in the morning, might be at seven, might be at eight in the morning. So you can never be sure when his day was starting. But he would have his breakfast. He liked to listen to the religious program on the SABC uh, every morning. And he would settle down to work. He was doing a university degree, did several degrees on, on the island. And he would read and listen to music and pass the day as constructively as possible. He fought against a despair, obviously. What eventually happened, he'd been on the island for six years in these quite terrible circumstances, never knowing when he was going to come out, could have gone on indefinitely. And it began to erode him. And there was clearly something wrong. And I think the government suddenly realized that they had a problem on their hands and they dumped him quick as a flash, put him into banishment in Kimberley. Banished to the township of Khaleshiwe, outside Kimberley on the 14th of May 1969, under house arrest and constant surveillance, Sabukwe was able to establish roots, settle down with his family and study law. In 1975, he was admitted to the bar and established a thriving legal practice. Despite the stringent terms of banishment and the incapacitating fear and intimidation that permeated South African society, Sabukwe continued to articulate his beliefs. His engagement with members of the South African student organization with whom he formed lasting friendships influenced the nascent black consciousness movement. In Kimberley, we used to sit and talk 50 feet away, the security police would be in their car, just sitting there watching us all the time. The late Steve Biko uh, contravened these bannings, uh, possibly once, perhaps twice, to go across country to see Sabukwe, and that would have been an illegal meeting. He wasn't trying to arouse the population, but his presence was important there. The mere fact that he was there, and people knew he was there, contributed to the politicization of the community in Galashewe. Oh, Malume was modest. He was a humble man. There are a lot of good things we picked up from him. When he was off duty, he looked so handsome in his khaki attire. Working in his garden, we used to stand up and marvel at this wonderful, but what type of a man is this? Such a well-learned man, such a brave man, but oh, so humble. Or he would come home in the afternoons from court. Our, our shoe store was across the road from the magistrate court. And he'd find a woman crossing the road and he'd get hold of a bag of potatoes, whatever parcel she was carrying, sling it over his shoulder with his briefcase in one hand and his gown over the other arm and he'd help her across the road. That was Robert. The phrase that always resounded in my mind when I would think of him was the one from Chaucer a gentle, perfect night 
and this enormously gentle, courteous person, we'd walk through the streets of Kimberley, and there were always greetings for him, and he would politely greet everyone. Didn't matter who they were, he would greet them. He never accepted that he was dying. And my wife Anne and I went down, and we spent a Saturday with him in his room, and we talked quietly, and then he'd sleep again. And he told me he didn't believe he was going to die, that he had a destiny to fulfill, and God would ensure that he fulfilled that destiny. And um, by the end of the day, he was a lot better. But less than a week later, at about two in the morning, Veronica phoned me to say he died. He was a very humble man. People used to love him. And I can't say it's because he was intelligent. He used to tell me that, don't say so much about your husband, Zoto. <laughs> so I won't say too much about him. I won't praise him now. The people will praise him, not me. It was as if there was a dark cloud in Kimberley. All of us were asking God, why now? When we thought, here comes light for Kimberley, then all of a sudden, it was dim. A lot of people prepared Malume's funeral, but I tell you, it was painful. The whole of Kimberley went over to Hrafreinit. Throughout his life, Sabukwe held the unshakable belief that in his lifetime, South Africa would be part of a liberated, united Africa. This is the cause to which he committed his life. He was not able to witness his oft-stated dream of South Africa's youth walking tall in a country they call their own. On the 27th of February 1978, Robert Sabukwe, at the age of 53, died of lung cancer. Sabukwe once wrote, True leadership demands complete subjugation of self, absolute honesty, integrity and uprightness of character, courage and fearlessness, and above all, a consuming love for one's people. Tragically, South Africa has been denied the contribution of Robert Mangaliso Sabukwe. Nevertheless, his legacy lives on.